market. So one question I wanted to pose to you guys, because you both are a little bit older than me. In 2008, or the dot-com crash, were you able to have a moment? I saw a little bit of this on Twitter where you were able to capitalize off of some of this stuff. And if you did, can you talk a little bit on how you did it? And if you didn't, do you think this is that time for you to make a lot of money on the on the backside of this? I did it in real estate. So I had, I was... I just got back from the military around that time, around 2009, 2010, which was a great time to be in the military because I was getting a ton of cash all over the place. And uh, the real estate market had bottomed at the time. So that's when I bought my condo in Williamsburg. I saw like the area had been completely decimated. I I really pulled off a, a really good job negotiating for my condo, which is like four to five X right now. So not only did I get to live in a place for like almost 10 years, now it's actually gone up four times from what I paid for it. So there are definitely times where if you are in the right place at the right time, you can do very well. I will say one thing that I did mess up on during that time is that I I didn't buy Apple and I actually bought BlackBerry because the thing is at the time, BlackBerry was all the rage and Apple was still a new entrant into the into the sector. So I was always playing on, well, BlackBerry, you know, they're, they're the value play. They're the ones that are, you know, all over. They have they just need to get better at creating a similar product like Apple and then they'll dominate Apple. And uh, instead of hedging my bets, which I should have just bought half Apple and half BlackBerry, I bought BlackBerry. And in which case I rode the market down two, three years. And then eventually I switched to Apple. But it was it was one of those realizations that you have that don't buy the cheap company just because the valuation is cheap. Like look for a company that's beating expectations, that's executing. And ever since I started thinking with that logic, I've done really well in the market where I'm always looking for the company that's executing, not the company that is not executing, that's still kind of start. Like think about Yahoo versus Google, right? At one point, Yahoo was the dominant search area, but Google was the one that was executing a lot better, in which case they ended up lapping um, uh, Yahoo out of the out of the way. If you look at Palantir and Snowflake, it's a similar model, right? Like if you look at when we started, Palantir had a higher revenue than than Snowflake did, right? Now Snowflake lapped Palantir and it's still growing. Like right in the last quarter, Palantir had it didn't break five hundred million. Snowflake did it with ease, right? So you want to stay in companies that are executing, even if the valuation seems a little bit stretched. You know that 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 stretched premium that you're paying sometimes it's worth it you know and i think this time around when it comes to certain companies that's what i'm going to be looking for also to say look if a company's executing they're still growing at a really fast pace you know buy into them and and you know and hold on to them meta for me is a very short term play i think that they still have the ability to execute um but they're so in deep value territory right now that they're not like which other social media company right now is out there that you can invest in that's going to lap meta, right? So I would say right now is just have some patience, wait for the market to bottom a little bit, let the bottom form, let the Fed start showing you, you know, it's done with its, you know, market crushing ways and then and then just go in and buy the companies that are executing that you think are going to be, you know, like big players in the future. You know. So, okay. uh, in dot com, yeah, I think my account got wiped off. I think I lost around seventy or eighty thousand Indian rupees, which is like two or three thousand US dollars. It was a big amount for me uh, that particular time. time. Now, two thousand is not bulk for you. We know it's bulk for you, but <laughs> at the time, two thousand bucks was a lot of money. So the reason it's not bulk for me today because. Even after those incidents, I keep coming back in market and keep learning. Yeah. Okay. So uh, that was one of the, yeah, I mean, I was scared. I, I had, there were nights I didn't sleep. I mean, you lose money, you are young, you worked hard for it. So I'm, I can relate with a lot of people what's what they are going through. Okay. I decided to went back to college. Uh, I took admission in IIT. I finished my geophysics. I got the job. And then I started doing some mutual funds. So in 2008, actually, that particular time, I was not following market that closely on day to day basis. I knew things are ongoing, but my idea was don't take risks, go with mutual funds, things like that. 
so i survived market just by by pure luck so i bought a flat in bombay okay and to buy that flat i have to sell everything i own and i took a hefty loan so on one hand i bought a costly flat because i it was the peak of the housing market in india at that time but since i sold anything i was not holding anything when the actual crash came as far as house was concerned i was living in that for another 2 years and i held it for 4 years so i mean if you have property in bombay you know you will rarely lose money on that so it was pure luck i mean luck works sometimes i need once i remember i needed to pay my mba fees it was 170000 sing dollar and of course if i am going to stay and leave in time in singapore and traveling for my electives to france so i sold my shlamaja stock okay that day when i sold shlamaja stock by accident okay I, uh, there's a whole story behind it but it was like 117 dollars it was the highest shlamaja stock has ever gone so selling so a stock of a top. company i sold at the top and when i when the reason for i was selling it because i thought i need to pay fees i was thinking still it will go high but it never went back wow so yeah these would, things like this happen would you say that's pure luck it was pure luck i mean i have so you will have luck both ways i mean i have survived another time there was a time i was playing very heavy in xib which is inverse volatility etf then i got transferred to to nigeria and my broker said they don't uh, allow if you are res- residing in nigeria they don't allow so i closed my account and so i had to liquidate my position and i don't know how many of you know that inverse volatility crash of 2018 19 i mean it literally wiped off 95% value and 96% overnight wow. that means if you have a position you went to sleep and by the way you morning your 96% is gone so yeah these kind of things can happen sometimes it's bad also like this year i lost all of my profit in klarna actually my like i said the loss of klarna i looked back and i wasn't concerned of losing that profit i was more concerned about that did i get it wrong so of course i did another dd i connected with different people i have been following the the company uh, performance since then and now i'm a bit more comfortable about it in addition to that like for example this year was pretty bad but i still had my position in spacex i mean spacex still went from 100 to 140 so that's a decent gain on a chunk of position i did another one in mestios last year i was not so sure that time but it was 25 million in valuation now it is 140 million so another decent gain on that so yeah it's a it's a mixed bag so that's why i say i mean i'm not a big fan of diversification my idea is always to find the right companies and that's why uh i don't i'm not into this mentality also like beating the market okay i'm not buying the market so why do i worry about beating the market i'm buying a certain company i have certain thesis i want to see whether it plays out or not in the process if it beats market it's fine if it doesn't beat it doesn't beat okay if you go by market you're not looking for 10% 15% my idea is like if you go into a position if there is an if there is no chance of making less than 2x i will never buy it why okay so i because i take high risk i put my effort into that okay so and i like so, so my strategy for investing is dumbbell strategy so dumbbell strategy is that on one hand one end of the dumbbell i stay debt free i have zero debt okay i keep cash in 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 pocket for the expenses for next 8 to 12 months okay that means i stay in a liquid form in a way on the other hand of the dumbbell i go for high risk high reward investment strategies okay so i don't take leverage i do not take any margins okay but i invest in a very what you will consider on a general average consider it's a high risk high return kind of a strategy so this is what i call like it's a dumbbell strategy on one hand so that if i have to stay liquid for another 8 months 12 months or for another 2 years i know it can happen i have to be a back holder during this time so i think about it but it doesn't change my investing style yeah okay. for for me i'm a little bit different in that i have a set of pri well i'm kind of like such in two little bit i guess i have a set of priorities that i fulfill before i i invest anything so the first thing is housing like i grew up poor i literally grew up in a one bedroom apartment with my brother me and my dad and my mom so one of the things that has always scarred me was always have your own property like the fact that like a guy can come and knock on your door every month and ask for rent and if you don't have you know and if if the lease is up they can double your rent at any time like we've moved 
three times um, in my life and all three times were traumatic because every time was we lived somewhere, you know, the area turned, you know, became really nice. And then it was like, okay, the rent just went up by 200% and we had to move. And then we ended up moving into another bad neighborhood and then the bad neighborhood got better. And it was every time my parents and myself would bring better equity, we would invest in the, in the neighborhood by, you know, being good, good citizens in our area but uh, we never enjoyed the benefits of that. So one of the first things that I always did to my uh, from from my own in, like life was always have a home that you can call your own, so that you never have to worry about you know the rent going up or whatever, right? Um, so that's that's number one. So the first thing I'm always advocating is making sure that you own your own property. So I own my own condo in New York. I have my own condo here in um, in Atlanta. Right. So those housing situation, like I'll never be homeless. I'm I'm good to go on that front. Then comes retirement. Me and my wife, we max out our retirement funds every single year, no matter what. And we typically only do conservative investing in our retirement accounts. Um, I do specifically um, bonds. And sometimes we just stay in a cash position, like um, when the times are a little overvalued, like my wife's entire 401k right now is just sitting in cash. Um, my 401k for the most part is sitting in cash. And then I have like bonds on top of that. So, um, the corporate bonds that I know that are going to be able to guarantee me a nice fixed return between 10 and 15%, um, for the next 10 years. Right. So that aside, once all those things are paid and done and over with, then I have my own portfolio and my wife has her own portfolio that we invest in. So those are like our more riskier things that we're, you know, we're, that we use to, um, that we use to basically invest. And uh, each, each account has a different risk profile, right? For housing, I never risk anything. For my retirement, I typically want to, um, you know, be low risk because that's, that's my nest egg money. And then my high risk is usually the cash position that I have. And like, that's the, that's the kind of things that I did with uh, you, Amit, when I invested in, um, in your startup, right? So those are the kinds of logic that I have when I'm investing. Now, unlike uh, Sachin, who does the barbell strategy, I'm more of like, hey, I want to know based on research, if I'm buying something that's undervalued or overvalued, and then at the same time, factor in other things like the company's growth, the company's ability to execute, where they are in the market cycle, and then invest conserv conservatively over a period of time. So I don't go all in on anything. I typically will dollar cost averages. You guys know I'm a big advocate for dollar cost averaging. Even if I think a company is going to do very well, I'm always going to dollar cost average. So that this way I know that, you know what, I have this ability to go to sleep at night <laughs> without having to um, to worry that, hey, I have so much money in the market. You know, So those are, those are the kinds of things that I typically do. And that's yeah, good. that's a great explanation. That's great. Yeah. Uh, that awesome. yeah. I think uh, I think one thing which Chris has said is most important. You should know your risk appetite based on your ability to sleep. If your position is not letting you to sleep, yeah, I mean, you are overexposed. Okay, whatever I have, I mean, like my 401k is in SpaceX, all of it. Wow. Wait, so, your whole 401k is in SpaceX. Like my all my retirement is in a SpaceX. Okay. Now, Wait, how did you all... how did you how did you do Wait. that? How did you switch it to Chris? Go ahead. Uh Amit, someone asked me real quick on there, Chris, do you mean 401k or do you mean Roth IRA? So I have a 401k through my job because I've been working and I always worked and I have a personal Roth IRA that I put money into. So I, and I also have a traditional IRA when I was making a lot more money the last few years before that. But the 401k um, is yeah. all cash? Yeah. Yeah. Well, my, my wife's 401k is all cash. Mine is right now about 50% cash with another 25% in bonds and 25% in the S and P 500. Okay, cool. Yeah. Sorry. So, Sachin, uh, sorry about that. No, you're good. Sachin, how did you switch all of your, your 401k before? Cause you had a 401k before SpaceX, I'm assuming. So how did so, you transfer it? So uh, my retirement money used to be with Schlumberger. So in Schlumberger, like if you stay like 15 years, then you vested and you get a pension. Okay. But before it was about to vest, I took a decision to leave Schlumberger. Mm. So that time Schlumberger gave me the option. I took the money and I opened a separate private account. And guys, I'm not a US citizen. 
so the i mean i i'm an expert so i had certain advantages in terms of opening account i opened account in switzerland and i used that money <laughs> to specifically invest in spacex so you opened a swiss bank account with a lot of different advantages and you put that swiss, money into yes yeah, swiss uh, pe account let's say okay which, because that allows me and i use all this money and i went uh, yeah i went into spacex so the so schlumberger when, went, when you when you left before the 15th year which means they gave you a chunk of cash that was not as much as what a pension would be correct but the, it's still you just you earned it over the See, again it, it depends on your risk appetite some people would have i mean schlumberger pension is one of the best in the business but you need your pension is also a risk cover so it uh, goes back to your risk appetite okay in my case like so when i went i think i took a space exposition when the stock was between 16 to 22 dollar i mean it was before a split those days it was 160 to 220 it has a 10 is to 1 split in the private market and nowadays like in the last like 140 150 i think it is like 82 dollar nowadays okay so so the reason is is uh, like i said i mean you take a certain risk you it it comes with both downside and upside so you okay, you have 5x or 401k essentially so far uh since i have to pay uh, quite a significant fees on that i wouldn't say 5x but i would say a 4x because 20% is the carried that goes to the company and the company would be schlumberger no no the company is a, it's a private company in switzerland the, who the, the, okay okay got gotcha, 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 gotcha. who made this arrangement for me so when you were th- what did you what do you feel about chris's argument about like having a home and all this stuff. I mean, putting your 401k in a private startup is pretty risky. Did you feel like you had a lot of other things taken care of? Because if that goes, to, if SpaceX fails, I mean, th- that would put you back in life, I'm assuming. See, I was getting my expenses paid. I mean, after I left Schlumberger, I joined Boston Consulting. So I was reasonably okay. I don't have to worry about my month-to-month expenses. Okay, and... Uh, and when I left Schlumberger, I think that was also the time when I started thinking that Am I only working for retirement pension? Mm. And I'm really working for retirement pension to be at the age of 65. I said, at the end of the day, what do I need? Okay. I said, okay, if you need $20,000, okay, per month, and you are looking for, so what are you looking Looking 5 million, 6 million? I said, the question that starts coming to you is at some point you ask, okay, why not 20 million? Why not 25 million? Why not 50 million? Okay. So, it's a basic process everyone goes through at some point of time you can get very greedy about it so i thought okay if i have to do it how do i do it mm-hmm. so i thought about it okay uh, being in boston consulting i have several restrictions i cannot buy a lot of public equities because i had insider information every time i buy something i have to declare it i need to get a clearance on it okay i don't buy like nancy pelosi who buy first and declare later i can only buy once i have a clearance Okay, so this is one of the reasons I started changing. And also, I mean, like, I mean, I read a lot. I'm a nerd in that way. I mean, I have been studying investing for, for so long now. Okay, you, you've seen so many examples. So at some point, I decided, okay, yeah, I have to, uh, my risk appetite is, is slightly different. I knew that because I was working in oil and gas, even the kind of decisions I was taking in very large mega capital projects. So I started getting that you need to tailor your investing to your risk appetite. Okay, so uh, yeah, and, and the one last thing, Sachin's on a way different income bracket than I am or you are, Amit. So when it comes down to it, the disposable income is the most important thing. Like, yeah, there is a level of disposable income that Sachin has that we don't have right now, right? Which means that the access to capital for Sachin is way higher. So he can be a little bit more outsized with risks rather than what we can. Like at the end of the day, I need my eggs more than such a needs yeah. his. So no, I agree. I mean, I afforded the ability to take on more risk. I, I, I totally agree with it. I mean, I started my first job and I started, it was like, uh, my first job was like $300 or $250 per month. So, I mean, my focus those days was work hard, uh, grow up in the corporate ladder. Okay. And yeah, I think uh, those particular days I was more a passive investor because my focus was entirely on building my capability to generate my monthly income. Okay. 
now when you reach a certain level i think i my career grew fast the question is uh, that particular time is more about deploying cash okay i kept it very clear to me i'm not going to take any debt so that allowed me to take some risky decisions as well okay i mean i build reasonable uh, corporate presence so that in case if i run into an emergency i can find a job which can at least pay my bill okay that's my bottom line so yeah i think that's pretty much you need to think about scenarios if everything is going wrong what will you do if you do not have that scenario taken care of yeah i think uh, everything else you are doing is is pretty much a gamble yeah okay any investment right. you have it could wipe off and uh, so you really need to figure out like if things go wrong what will you do and how long you can hold yourself if you start taking care of that part only then you start taking care of the risky side that's what i said i, I have this kind of a dumbbell strategy where i look for safety in near term but then i look for i mean risk in long term okay i think a lot of time what people does like for example if you are holding cash i mean cash is very safe in near term but cash is very risky to hold in long term so same thing with the stocks the stocks are very risky to hold in near term but they are very safe to hold in long term okay so how do you look you i mean a lot of time what happens is we put a lot of risk in near term scenarios and that's where it becomes a very emotional turmoil i'm seeing a lot of people going through it and you know one thing is don't make your investing a cult a lot of people i see nowadays in tesla struggling because tesla is a cult a lot of time i mean it's a it's a brilliant company brilliant investment opportunity but people are not investing in tesla because it's an investment opportunity a lot of people are investing in tesla because it has become a cult or you buy it 1200 you hold it guys i mean what do you expect it's a high beta stock it has run it was a leader and it ran away from the market from all of its peers you are into a uh, macro slowdown economic slowdown sector slowdown high interest rate yeah the stock is uh, if tesla doesn't decline 60 70% as it is now then i would say tesla is a bubble so to me when i see this decline and it may decline as to me that's very healthy because if you see tesla forward pe today it's actually same as apple forward pe there is no difference and tesla is growing 40% while apple is growing 8% so if you ask me like how do i see tesla versus apple opportunity it's pretty clear now if you if you are buying tesla because of elon musk if you are selling tesla because of elon musk because both kind of people exist guys i mean keep your political convictions when you go for vote okay when you are going to investment you have to be ruthless see the opportunity make money and lot of time you know don't lot of time the the 90% of our mistakes in investing are driven only by two things the first thing is the position we never bought and it went to the moon and we never get that pain away and the second thing is the position we sold because it was red for us and as soon as we sold it went green and it went to the moon if it happens it happens i mean this is life okay you just need to look back and see that why you didn't buy it and why you why, why did you sell it uh, that's a better way to look rather than uh, anything else i mean these things will happen see at the end of the day you need conviction to put some time in your life a sizable money on a position an opportunity and that position can go 5x to 10x if you get three of those things in your life you're done Yeah. So yeah, you can miss hundred of these things, two hundred of these things. You only need three to five, because if you get three to five right, okay. So every time anything goes wrong, think about it. What lesson it gave? A lot of time we have value of hindsight, but I think looking into hindsight is very dangerous. Always try to look back. That's what I say. If you are an investor and you are not making notes, you're not writing your thoughts. Yeah, there is no learning there. You always have to write that. What do you think at this point in this position? okay and it's good to read that what you have written after 6 months 1 year sometime even 10 years okay i have like several of my diaries okay i, I have done written them um, I, i write them once in a while but i write about different positions and a lot of time when i do like private equity people ask me sometime i give them my notes from that time and yeah it works so because you cannot it's an emotional it's an emotional involvement and you have to take your emotions away from it 
Especially okay. if you have a conviction that you allocate a consolidated amount of your position in, it's incredibly emotional because there's going to be a time where that position goes down. Uh, like you're with yep. the Palantir and Klarna right now. But the only way you get a SpaceX-like return is if you have a sizable position. Like if you put a dollar into SpaceX, it doesn't matter if it, you know, 17,000 Xs, right? Like, so the, the, the consolidation of an equity position has to be filled with conviction regardless of your emotional appetite. And you may still get it wrong, but if you, you never have that... Wrong. If you never have that conviction, so, you never have the chance. So there, I mean, when you talk it about wrong, there are two things you need to remember. Whether your thesis were wrong or you didn't have the information. Mm. There are two things. Okay. That means how the information that was available, have you interpreted it right? Right. If you didn't have the information, yeah, I think you couldn't. And that's what I say. Like I keep very consolidated portfolio because I do very in-depth research for these companies. Okay, for these companies, I have so many Google alerts. I have, I check on LinkedIn who they are hiring. Like for example, I mean, there was a position. Uh, of everybody was concerned in 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 one of the fund I was inv- advising, and I said, okay, let's start looking LinkedIn. Okay, because their position. And then I started looking LinkedIn and said that they are hiring a lot of salespersons. I said it looks like they are going into a sales and expansion mode. So let's take it. Okay, they did. Valuation, they did raise money this year, the position went 2x. Hmm. Okay, so there are so much information that is available, okay, but how you use it is entirely yours. Okay, uh, I talk to employees, I mean, uh, I do a lot of one to one calls. I mean, this is how Chris and Amit, I met with, with you guys also in the starting. Okay, uh, I, I mean, when you work in sectors, you meet a different, I mean, everybody is working somewhere. Okay, like for example, if, even if you are watching Netflix, you are getting information. You watch Netflix, you watch uh, Prime, you watch HBO, you watch Disney. I mean, I, I, I use these services for a while and I knew that watching on Netflix is so frictionless. Okay, then I watched some of the things in India and I came up with an opinion that streaming wars are over. I mean, there is nothing because as far as the rest of the platforms are concerned, they need to make their platform better. But now the streaming war is all about content. So streaming wars, next phase is content wars. Okay. Yeah. Now, if you see Netflix today, they are, they, so if, if you cannot explain their content strategy, there is no point of being invested in Netflix. Hmm. Okay. So everyone has access to something. How do you use it and how do you observe it? And that is your edge. And you think the best way to not mess up on the, thesis part which is information everyone has access to it in certain ways the thesis part is to just do a massive level of research and kind of do what i did right i talked to you in january and like talk to as many people as you can before you decide to do the consolidated position where you're okay with whatever happens see uh your research should be up to a level where you where you are obsessed about it because until yeah. and unless you're obsessed about it, you cannot get insights. For example, you can read a lot of information. Okay. Um, but I mean, like a lot of time, I don't know how I'm sleeping and I'm thinking and chart is in front of me of Palantir because I'm so obsessed about it at times. Mm. Okay. When I was thinking about SpaceX, I was sleeping and I was seeing rocket launches and things like that. So it the reason what happens is that when you reach a certain level of obsession, okay, you you have digested a lot of information, you find a very different kind of insight. So for example, like why I change my view on Tesla. Okay, I was, I mean, anyone like, like I said, I mean, and I mean, to remember it was we discussed in one of my interview, I think this is the first time when we discussed about the why the MBAs missed the Tesla. In my strategy class, in my uh, strategy class in NCR, the strategy case we did was on Tesla. And that time, Tesla was 30, 34 billion or maybe less than that. And everything was about strategy and that's it. But at the end of the day, it's an automotive company. It's already overvalued. And everybody in the class kind of agreed with that. And I agreed with that. Nice company, overvalued company. When I sat in Tesla in Hong Kong, I think uh, two, three years after that, I mean, you remember, guys, I leave in... Southeast Asia, I mean, there were no Teslas here. So during my trip, I get to sit in Tesla in Hong Kong. And, and I said, man, this car is, is fucking cool. It's I would pr- prefer to buy it over BMW and Mercedes. And that particular time, I started thinking that they have built something that that's a very different kind of a product. Okay. 
So that's where I started looking back into it. So when I look back into it, I mean, of course, the SpaceX also, uh, then the question for me came is that, okay, I'm building a conviction around it. Can I turn it into an action? I think that's where your thesis comes in picture. The moment I start learning about Starlink, uh, I knew that Starlink is a big opportunity. I have, so you remember I'm a geophysicist. So that means I spent time in seismic processing and some time on seismic vessels. So if you are on a vessel in offshore, and you use internet there, you know how super expensive it is, how difficult it is. So in ISP, I always realize that uh, traditional market has a kind of a handicap, okay? Because you every time you need to, the infrastructure is the major reason that you go to a poorer area, you will get very slow internet. But the way they, they design using the, the, what we call today as a Leo constellation, the low earth orbit, that every time you add another uh, satellite, it improves the efficiency of whole system. And it is actually better in places where the traditional infrastructure is bad. So this is what I call like a blue ocean strategy. Okay, they are penetrating in a market where there is no competition. Okay, and launching satellite is not like you get five dude into a, into a car garage and write a code. You have to fucking launch the rockets. <laughs> So the, the barriers of entry was huge. Okay, then I started looking how big the internet market is. And I said, okay, the internet market penetration in the two, that time the world was 46%. All of that 46%, okay, that means if you see the quality internet globally was only accessible to 25%. That means three-fourths of the world population doesn't have high quality good internet. So it was a huge market. Okay, we have already seen what Google and Facebook with their balloon thing try to give free internet. So the reason these companies were doing the Google and Facebook is they realized that if they can give a democratic access to internet to everyone, they can get a lot of data and it's a huge value. So there was a case for it, but nobody was able to crack the code and this guy cracked it. And everything that was happening in terms of launching uh, astronauts and I mean, everything else, I thought that business is actually free if you can get the ISP cracked with it. So the reason I managed to get that kind of insight because over the time you think uh, on different companies, different strategies, and somehow these things start coming together. So these things only come together if you have been obsessed about these things for a while. Right. So a lot of time I discuss with my friends, I shared with them, everybody said oh, it makes sense, but nobody invested when I invested. I went alone. After I invested, several of my friends also invested later on in, in different rounds. So, yeah. Do you have friends that feel the same way about Palantir? Have they kind of not invested as well? Do they get your thesis? Have you talked to them about it? Like you Oh, I talked to them. I mean, uh, and at this point, to be honest, my account in Palantir is right. So, uh, yeah, they say we, we listen to you, but we haven't invested yet. There are a couple of friends I know who have invested. I actually wrote a blog, I think, in December or November 2020 on Reddit. And this blog was that, so I was doing like this, six months research on different companies with everything I have. And I said that out of everything I have done is SpaceX and Palantir to me look closer to what Monopoly will look like in 2030. I don't mm. know whether it's right or wrong. Okay. I went to big in both companies. We'll see how it works out. <laughs> <laughs>